How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern, and Saturdays at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 Eastern with Jim Valley. And oh, what will Jim Valley have to talk about this weekend? Well, obviously, the same thing I'm going to talk about today, this MJF promo. What you guys think of it? I see it has been very, very polarizing on the social media. So we're going to talk about it here today on the show, as well as all of AEW Dynamite. And in addition to that, yes, everybody, we have two WWE pay-per-views this weekend. Two Peacock Premium Events, PPEs. Which, by the way, I've been uh, covered head to toe in PPEs the last couple of days. I'm in uh, quarantine here. Thank God for you people here live can entertain me for an hour. But anyway, we'll go over the lineups for both the NXT 2.0 pay-per-view, which I'm sure many of you are are clamoring to watch tomorrow night, as well as the Hell in a Cell show, which at least is going to have a good main event with Cody and Seth Rollins, Bianca Oscar and Becky should be good. Uh, the six-person mixed tag should be good. Uh, Ezekiel and Kevin Owens, well, Kevin Owens is entertaining. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, there's only six matches right now, and they're all, every single one of them is a Raw match. There are no SmackDown matches on this show, so presumably they'll add some tomorrow. Talk about Forbidden Door. We can talk about ratings. The Memorial Day edition of Raw did horrible, which, of course, led to people on the Internet concluding that, ah, uh, oh, the show's dead. Well, actually, it was on Memorial Day, so it's not dead. This happens every year. And we got the ratings for the Go Home Show for NXT, uh, Best of the Super Juniors, and so much more. If you would like to give us your feedback today, 425-780-7566. That is 425-780-7566. Back in a moment to kick it off, Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. And uh, everyone's talking about the MJF promo in the chat right now. And uh, there was a line that MJF had last night. I don't have it verbatim, but he essentially said, all you fans are marks. And uh, anyway. Do you agree? <laughs> well, here's what I'll say. Don't be marks, everybody. I'm not saying you are, but don't be marks, okay? Bro. My that, that uh, Sports Illustrated article that yesterday was was impeccably timed, if I do say so myself. Because for that brief period that MJF was gone, I'm still the best heel in all of wrestling. Now, <laughs> let's talk about this promo, okay? So, his promo, his delivery, his delivery, absolutely, completely fantastic. Out of A this plus. world. Absolutely. Out of this world. This guy, like, I mean... In any in any universe, this guy wins best on promos by a landslide, okay? Now, with all that out of the way. And boy, did he talk about a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Boy, did he talk about a lot of stuff. Yeah, he did. And, uh, I mean, obviously, if you can't figure this out, it wasn't a shoot. I mean, hello. And uh, And, boy, did he talk about a lot of things that were... Supposedly a shoot. Hmm. Didn't he? Yeah. So, uh, here's the thing, everybody. If you liked it, that's awesome. If you didn't like it, that's awesome. Okay? At the end of the day, here's here's the deal. I have seen this attempted a million times, okay? It almost never works. Okay? That doesn't mean it can't work, but it almost never works. All right? Now, whether you liked it or not, okay, it already didn't work yesterday. What? Do, what are you talking about, Brian? Well, did you watch it? In no universe was he hoping to be cheered for his promo. You can listen to the promo. He was trying everything in his power to get booed and to be the biggest heel, and this is exactly... This is exactly what happened with the CM Punk Pipe Bomb promo. If you recall correctly, that promo was written with the idea that Punk was going to be a heel. Because Vince is so out of his mind 
that he thought CM Punk saying all of these terrible things about this company, oh, the fans are going to turn on him because they stand up for WWE. Well, turns out it ends up being a massive babyface promo that people talk about to this day. And, uh, you know, as much as people like to think, you know, it's legendary and this and that, there's a lot of things that are legendary in wrestling. But at the end of the day, they don't really make that much of a difference in business. And uh, do you guys remember the follow-up to the pipe bomb promo? Bro, everybody had every idea about where this was going to go. He's going to take that belt. He's going to go to uh, Ring of Honor, whatever. And he was just back on TV, and, and they, like, you know, he was just another pro wrestler. Immediately. Immediately. Okay. So if you think that, like, the pipe bomb promo led to, like, some big explosion in business for WWE, it didn't. If you think that the the Brian Pillman angle led to this big explosion of business for WCW, it didn't. You know what it led to? It led to WCW losing Brian Pillman. Brian Pillman was granted a release because he convinced Eric Bischoff, dude, in order to make people believe this is real, you got to give me, like, a real release. If you give me a real release... Then everybody's going to think this is real. So I gave him a real release, and he went and signed with WWE. It benefited one guy, which was Brian Pillman. And quite frankly, even when Brian Pillman went to WWE, WWF, WWF business didn't explode because they got Brian Pillman. So I've seen this a million times. And what happened was he did a promo that he thought was going to be a massive heel promo, and most of it was. But the problem is... When you air a grievance that some fans also have, that's when you run the risk as a heel of turning babyface and having people cheer you over the company. That absolutely happened last night. Dude, this guy got cheered. He got the biggest pop when he mentioned, you know, would you pay me better if I was an ex-WWE guy? They went crazy. Because there is a subset of the fans... They think, you know what, I, I, I am sick of all these ex-WWE guys. Like, you know, I'm loyal to the originals. So there is something there. And then, of course, you know, during the break, they're chanting his name. And, you know, he, he turned himself babyface. And I don't think he was intending to. So now, I mean, obviously everything is, well, how do we follow up with this? That's my question. How do we follow up with this? So, you know, last night I was like, Dave, what's the end game? What's the end game? And he, he says, well, the end game is to, uh, you know, make a big megastar. And, uh, and boost ratings. Okay, that's fine. How are you going to do that? What's the end game here? How did WWE explode business with the Steve Austin-Vince McMahon feud? Well, first off, Steve Austin, the wrestler, was the babyface, and the owner was the heel. And they never even intended to go this direction. This is another one. After Montreal, when Vince came on TV and did that Brett screwed Brett promo, you guys know that he wasn't trying to be heel Mr. McMahon. That was supposed to be a babyface promo. He thought, I'm going to bury this Bret Hart, and these fans stand up for WWE. They're going to be behind me. Well, they weren't. And uh, he became a massive heel. And then, obviously, they did that storyline. Plus, you know, what uh, the MGF storyline doesn't have is Mike Tyson, who was a massive mainstream star who ended up being hooked up with uh, Shawn Michaels and then uh, Steve Austin at WrestleMania. But uh, the point is, is Tony Khan, who has insisted, insisted that he's never going to be a television character. Well, is he going to be a character now? Because MGF called him out repeatedly by name in this promo. I don't think so. So then, okay, well, we got to uh, we got to shift this probably to what? CM Punk? So it's going to be CM Punk versus MJF, which I do expect to happen in uh, uh, probably uh, early September, all out. So uh, then the question is, well, right now, CM Punk, we got four weeks of build to Forbidden Door where CM Punk is not facing MJF. So is MJF on ice for weeks now? Is he going to vanish and we're not going to do any follow-up to this? So there's a lot of questions here, and believe me, don't even sit here and think that, oh, Brian's being such a jerk. Don't think that I haven't heard a lot of this also from people that work for the company that did not like that promo. And they felt that the promo buried the company. They felt the promo got over MGF as a babyface inadvertently. The idea that, in fact, you know, a lot of people do like Wardlow, and, uh, and they also felt that, man, you know, this was supposed to be Wardlow's weekend, and nobody's talking about Wardlow, and there's no follow-up to Wardlow whatsoever. He's feuding with Smart Mark over a lawsuit because he's beating up security guys. Don't think that I'm like, oh, Brian's being such a jerk, you know. 
Hey, listen, if you like it, like I said, that's great. Maybe that, listen, it's not impossible that they can make this thing work. Trust me. There have been a lot of things in, in AEW that I've been initially like, dude, what's going on here? And they've made it work, okay? But I've seen this a million times, and it hasn't worked. And you do run, you do run the risk of the unintended consequences of people turning on your company and siding with the wrestler. You guys remember Sasha and Naomi? Nobody was siding with WWE. Even though internally, including all of the other wrestlers who normally stand up for each other, they weren't on her side either. So we'll see where this goes, but uh, you're welcome to think whatever you want. It was, it was the first day. His delivery was absolutely fantastic. Everybody's talking about it. I mean, from that perspective, it was a big success. But I've seen things like this lead to failure. We'll see what happens. Feel free to keep talking about it so I don't have to and then take all the slings and arrows when I say that I was pretty nonplussed during the whole thing and maybe just because I'm bitter and old and everything. But much like you, I have seen this tried a zillion times. And the thing that stuck out to me was when he was coming down to the ring, it was like he's not going to sell anything. This is a guy that went out on a back brace and having oxygen sort of being applied to him, I guess, through his forehead and eyes. Uh, but nothing was sold from Wardlow and nothing was spoken about with Wardlow. And that just poof disappears. And that's that. And he doesn't sell a thing. And I'm thinking the same thing as he's going on is, is he going to face Tony Khan? Is CM Punk going to be aligned with Tony Khan as a, a company man? He's the guy who's the real ratings mover because they left that door open. So that's the direction I think they're going. But how they're getting there, eh, not a fan so far. Back in a moment, Observer Live. <sighs> yes? Nothing. Nothing. People's responses to this telling me why I'm supposed to... Uh, Hey, look, this is new to you for a lot of you people out there. You weren't alive when the pipe bomb promo was happening, or you were too young to They weren't alive. It, it wasn't that long know. ago. How long ago was it? I mean, God, it's it was 2022. Like 10 years some, ago. Some young bucks up in this chat and everything. I A lot of that promo, you know, I know he didn't say that other people were being unsafe. He just said he didn't drop people on his heads, but it's like. It's pro wrestling. You're supposed to say you're dropping people on your head. And you're not supposed to point out anybody else that is dropping people on their head. They shouldn't be in wrestling if they're doing it on a regular basis. There were just a lot of points in that promo. And who knows? Maybe it does work itself out. But I just don't see how this was beneficial to AEW. You know, using almost all your curse words in that segment and everything. And I just... The delivery is fantastic. He is on the track to being a legend because the things he does in the ring, some of the small things that he does, you know, those things get forgotten about because of how big his personality is and how great his promo skills are. And it was just something that whatever comes next, I know that there were executives there, but you didn't need to have MJF on last night. You didn't. You could have had something where he was off for a while, at least selling these things. And if he was going to do this promo, it wouldn't have been right after the pay-per-view where it just erased seemingly everything from the night before. And we're hyper-focused on the MJF Tony Khan feud and the countdown to him leaving to go to WWE. I just, I just kind of look at it and there are people that have from AEW's end that are either close or associated with AEW that have had either the same shrug that I have or have not liked it. And that's a very legitimate, real thing because it's just the same way. Is this, you know, is, is this really what we want to do? And, you know, we'll, we'll see. It's not my company and I'm willing to give it some, some room to breathe. But again, when has it worked before? And again, I know Dave's called it the Cornette playbook, but it is. I mean, Jim Cornette was calling it all friends wrestling and taking that route and going with it and then having people at the end cheer that and having it turn around and blow up in their face. When most of the time these things turn around and blow up in your, like you mentioned, with CM Punk and with Vince McMahon and with the intended reaction of getting these things, it never usually goes that way because you can't control the fans because it's like, ooh, this is real. It's like, uh, you know, I, I just, 
uh, unfortunately, well, let's go back to something you said earlier, brother. You're good bumbling around. So that listen, just sucks. I do. I, just, I, I think it's corny. I do want to say that uh, I did hear from a lot of people that also thought the uh, excessive profanity was a uh, a poorly chosen touch, given that all of the Time Warner executives were there. Now, granted. Do I think there's any chance that Tony didn't talk to these executives and say we're going to do this and of course there's going to be a lot of swearing? But with that said, you know, there's there's telling people what you're going to do and then actually doing it on national and, television. And having it come across and work. And did it and, work? And uh, I don't think it did. It came across as just kind of cheap and crass. And well, I know let me, that's let me, kind of the point of that. But The, the point is good. there's a time and a place to do that. And I would not have done it in front of Time Warner executives when you want a new television deal. That's just me. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they were like, dude, uh, he should say 10 swear words. Let's really go all out. I don't know. But I watched and I was like, wow, you chose tonight to do all of that? Yeah. Because, I mean, obviously, you know, a lot of it was was bleeped, but uh, not all of it. And uh, if you don't know what he said, I mean, it's out on the uh, in the Internet. But I And mean, this was not be- bleeped in Canada? Is that true? Well, it got or... through in Canada because I guess they got some some bloke with poor reaction time <laughs> pushing that Oops. button. Hey, let me get some more news and we'll talk about the whole show in a second. Do it. On a totally different note, we have two WWE pay-per-views this weekend. Two. I thought that one was this weekend and one was next weekend. No. So there's NXT 2.0's show on Saturday. <laughs> Cameron Grimes, Carmelo Hayes. Pretty Deadly versus the Creeds. Braun Breaker, Joe Gacy, where Braun can lose the title via DQ. Yeah. Open your wallet now. Toxic Attraction versus Katana Chance and Caden Carter. Mandy Rose versus Wendy Chu. And uh, Tony D'Angelo and uh, his blokes against uh, Santos Escobar and his blokes. One giant bloke stable at the end with the winner as the leader. Then the next day, we got another show. (laughs) Cody Rhodes versus Seth Rollins, Bianca versus Asuka versus Becky, Lashley versus Omos versus MVP, Ezekiel versus Kevin Owens, Theory versus Ali, and uh, Finn, AJ, and Liv versus Edge, Damian Priest, and Rhea Ripley. All Raw matches. We have no SmackDown matches at this moment. But there's only six matches, so presumably they'll add something tomorrow, but two days in a row, dude. That's my my, uh, quarantine celebration. You're not going to watch a GCW Tournament of Survival instead and report on that? No. <laughs> so also, uh, you know, I'd, I'd uh, been asked, you know, who should punk face at Forbidden Door? And you know. You, you knew my answer. Mm-hmm. Hiroshi Tanahashi. And in fact, that is the answer. Because when putting the show together, it's got to be matches where, you know, the AW person has to win certain matches and the, R- and the uh, New Japan person has to win other matches. And uh, they can, you know, they can they can beat Tanahashi. He can lose to CM Punk. And uh, the other one that's interesting is uh, Okada and Adam Page for the IWGP title, which uh, would be a fantastic match. But it's also the second job in a row for Hangman Page. But I guess they oh, figure, on. well, you know, if you have an, a fantastic match with Okada for the IWGP heavyweight title... And you get a bunch of great near falls. It doesn't matter if you lose again. So uh, I'm all I'm all for the match, quite frankly. And uh, there will be more matches announced after uh, I guess the best of the Super Juniors because I got to do whatever they're going to do there. And uh, that Dominion coming up too. Yes, uh, yeah, actually, actually after Dominion is when they'll probably because New Japan. Like I don't know if you guys know this or not, but uh, they do not announce cards until the previous show is over. And so it's going to be essentially the same thing with, uh, you know, this Dominion show. They're not going to uh, set up anything until after they've uh, gone through the show and the winners are the winners and the losers are the losers. But uh, Best of the Super Juniors is uh, tomorrow, June 3rd. You know, I was I was really surprised that there were that many people who kind of echoed what you said at the beginning about hangman adam page taking a second loss in a row and it's like man i would have figured you know it's just in the dna of an AEW fan to really understand new japan and understand kazuchika okada is one of the best wrestlers of all time i mean you can argue that now hiroshi tanahashi is one of the best wrestlers of all time arguably 
Actually, it's not arguable. He's in amongst the greatest baby faces of all time, hands down, no question, in that top percentile. And Okada is just the best. And Tanahashi is going to take a loss here to CM Punk because Tanahashi can do that. And the match is probably going to be great because of who's involved in it. And I think Paige and Okada is going to be, in its own way, just as great. It's going to be a athletic, I mean... Really, we're going to, I think, see top tier Okada. When Okada's the best, he is the absolute best. And he's the best at working with somebody else. And Hangman Page, I know he took an L. And I know this is, you know, how they're going to play it into his persona and some of the head games that he always has with himself. I'm sure they'll figure out a way to play it in there. But, I mean, Okada's one of the best wrestlers in the world, bar none. That's it. So I was surprised when there were some people really like, man, if this is true, man, Paige taking two big losses in a row. It's like you can play that into a story. It's not like he's losing to, you know, take the lowest guys on the roster, you know, and he's dropping falls to them. It's to one of the best professional wrestlers in the world who has been for the last God knows what, 10 years now. We got this thing going on in the chat, which is exactly what I was told from someone in AEW the day that the show was announced, which is. People are going to be mad. Why isn't this person in this person? Why isn't this person in this person? Because of politics, okay? Why isn't it Moxie versus Tanahashi? I don't know, but obviously there's a political reason, which is probably that they want that on a New Japan show. What do you want me to do about it? Why isn't it Punk and Kenta? Well, because Kenta was badly injured in that ladder match. And, uh, and quite frankly, I don't care if they both have the same move. Punk and Tanahashi for the title is a much bigger match than Punk and Kenta for the AEW yes, championship. With all I'm due sorry. Respect. Yes. So there <laughs> this is what's gonna happen. The show, the show is gonna be a great show, but you're not gonna get all of the matches you want. I've said that from day one. There's Baby politics steps. at play here. Yes. Like I a mean, lot well, of politics. Yes. You're gonna you're gonna look at that show when the full lineup is announced, and you're gonna say, Why is so and so and so and so not even on this show? Because of politics. And there are already big AEW names that, because of politics, aren't going to be on Forbidden Door. And it's going to be very obvious when they're not on Forbidden Door. But anyway. Well, uh, and let's also say, like, a lot of times we discuss politics and it's a negative, there's a negative connotation that comes from it. In this case, there's politics because there's moving pieces with these guys' promotions. And yeah, I mean,. I'm sure could everybody make every fantasy match in the world? Yeah, I'm sure that, you know, when you're booking at home, you can. But when you put things into actual, like, play, I mean, we see this again. We see this on the New Japan side. We've seen it with the All Japan show, with Noah, when they deal with other promotions. So it's like it's the very first show of them working together. There's going to be a lot more, hopefully, you know, mixed into. To, and again, let storylines play out. Let guys get to Japan and do some things and let some people from Japan come over now that the restrictions are down and let them do some things. We just had Wheeler Yuta go over. He's still over there for the, the finals of the best of the Super Juniors. But like, let's it's OK to let some things play out here and to hope that they're going to be working together in the future so we can have maybe one or two of these a year where. Maybe down the line we can get more of those dream matches, but let the relationship build itself first. And again, politics in this case is not a a negative as you know when we usually talk about like there's politics backstage and this person hates this person. No, there's just a lot of moving actual parts, you know, for your storylines that you need to deal with. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Alive. Mike Semper Vivi. Also WrestlingObserver.com. All right, uh, Couple of quick notes. Raw, Memorial Day, didn't do well. But it's Memorial Day. It never does well. 1.5 million first hour, 1.6 million second hour, 1.4 million third hour. So, uh, yeah, that's the story. All right, let's talk about this uh, this Dynamite show. Open up with Punk and FTR beating Max Caster in the Gun Club. Holy smokes, this crowd was out of their minds all night long. Just a fantastic crowd. 15,000 people in the forum. And uh, they went nuts for this match. They went nuts for the Gun Club and Bowens and Punk and FTR. Punk went crowd surfing. I think banged his leg on the guardrail. So uh, I'm sure that didn't feel good. And then, yes, we had another incident where Punk tried to springboard and fell down. And, man, they gave him hell for a second. But he got him back into it. Goes up top for the flying elbow. Puts his hands up and goes, Sorry! And uh, they all cheered him like crazy. And then uh, they did the FTR big rig finish. And then uh, Punk did a promo acknowledging the fall without talking about it. But basically saying, if you watch this match, 
I still got a lot to improve on. I got to get better. And that's what I'm going to do as champion. I'm going to get better. And then, of course, he asked, well, who's my opponent going to be at Forbidden Door? And uh, it was the debut of Hiroshi Tanahashi, who got a huge pop. And uh, CM Punk, Hiroshi Tanahashi, AEW world title coming up at Forbidden Door. And then, of course, we had the MGF promo, which we've talked about ad nauseum. Uh, this led to the return of Miro. Miro returned to face Johnny Elite and uh, killed this dude. Uh, avoided a dive, Mashka kick, game over, the former accolade, and got the submission. I'm actually not sure. Is jo- I don't even know if Johnny Elite is even signed. I'm, it feels like he's doing like per day per deals. Deal. Yeah, yeah for the that's what it feels like, too. It, it would make sense for him, considering the amount of indies in Mexico and other things that he has, that you know it's probably been more beneficial for him to have the deal that he has. Yes, per appearance, it appears. All right, we had a Jericho Appreciation Society promo, which was, uh, this was great. They let uh, they let both uh, Parker and Daddy Magic speak. I thought Daddy Magic was going to be a lot over, a lot more over than he actually was. But he still... Got a good reaction, but after those promos that he cut that were online, I guess not enough people saw them, but they were Melonhead. unbelievable. But anyway, uh, Jericho then does the promo, and uh, out comes Eddie Kingston and Regal. They announce that Blood and Guts is coming. At first, Jericho says he's not going to do Blood and Guts, but then Ortiz hits the ring, cuts off some of Jericho's hair. Jericho's furious, and so he accepts the challenge for Blood and Guts, which is coming up. Uh, we'll get the dates here in a moment. And uh, also says, on one condition... He will be facing Ortiz in a hair versus hair match. We'll see what happens. I know everyone thinks there's no way Jericho's losing his hair. And if you asked, I would say he's not losing his hair. But I can't guarantee that because he loves switching up his look. And uh, and it's summer and it's hot. You know how time Super Porky got its head shaved in the summer? I think for 29 <laughs> straight years. So, Is Jericho going back out on tour? It's hot out there on stage with Fozzie. So. Well, it is, but you know, you can wear a hat. Young Bucks, Red Dragon, and Hikaleo versus Jungle Boy, Luchasaurus, Christian Cage, Darby Allin, Matt Hardy. Absolutely great, fantastic party match. Until Hikaleo gets uh, low-bridged, and bro, this guy landed right on his head. And I'm not talking like, I use that term a lot. But, dude, this guy landed right on his head. And I thought he was dead, and the fans thought he was dead. And everyone in the match, I'm pretty sure, thought he was dead. And this bro just got right back up and kept going. So thank God he didn't get seriously Can hurt. you put that in layman's terms for everybody? That was so scary. He I'll landed upside terms. down only on his head. Not the rolling, not the back roll forward. He landed on his head outside. on the cement. Outside the ring. That's God. The- and then got right back up, and it's uh, and Jim Ross, I know, was shocked, but it's like, well, adrenaline, because I'm sure he had a bunch of adrenaline going through his body with the fact that he knew he could still feel his fingers and his toes. So yeah, he was right back up quick. A, a very tough man, that Hikaleo. Bucks hit the Meltzer driver on Jungle Boy, so it looks like we're going to get Young Bucks versus Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus for the tag team titles. Coming up here soon. We had uh, Swerve Strickland and Keith Lee promo with their entourage. We had an Athena promo where uh, Stokely came out to cut a promo for Jade. And uh, Kira Hogan stepped up, and then Chris Statlander showed up. And we got a lot of matches coming from this uh, this crew right here. Wardlow came out. He wrestled J.D. Drake. He powerbombed him twice. And then uh, Smart Mark came out and said, we're filing a lawsuit because you're beating up security. Wardlow beat up more security. <laughs> What'd you think? That's the follow-up to this two-and-a-half-year storyline. Bruh. Ruby Soho and Tony Storm versus Britt Baker and Jamie Hayter. It's a good match, although it looked like they were rushing to get this match done. They were going 1,000 miles an hour. And uh, the most horrifying move in all of wrestling is Tony Storm's running hip attack. She's killed... Everybody with this move. She killed Britt once. She killed Britt twice. And she killed Jamie Hayter in this match. Uh, Dude, go back and watch every single one of them. They are brutal. Well, and before you watch this one, watch the move right before that, because I think she rocked her. She rocked her with something before she ended up in the corner and then got smashed with Tony's maneuver. (laughs) 
And then uh, ended up with Ruby Soho pinning Britt Baker with the Destination Unknown. So it looks like she's going to be in line for one of the uh, one of the belts at some point here. All right, so Battle of the Belts is August 5th, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Rampage Friday, and we don't need uh, Fauntleroy because this will be a live show. Young Bucks versus the Lucha Brothers, the debut of Athena, and Scorpio Sky defending the TNT title against Dante Martin. Dynamite next week, Hangman Page versus David Finley. It should be a great match. Big win for Hangman to set up uh, presumably the match with Okada. And then the main event was John Moxley, Daniel Garcia with Jericho and William Regal. I believe for the first time ever, they had a four-minute overrun. And even though I put over YouTube TV as never, ever screwing up any of my recordings, they must not have known because I didn't see the very end of this. It just cut off. So uh, I don't know what happened. I got a report, but they had a really good match. Moxley is awesome. Garcia is great. Moxie's just cut all up from Sunday. He's bleeding everywhere. They're beating the hell out of each other. Bumps through the announcer's table. And uh, finally, uh, comes out to... uh, Yeah, Jericho runs down to the ring to distract Moxley. But Eddie Kingston runs down to make the save, but he trips. And he literally stumbled into Chris Jericho, so it all worked out. And then uh, Moxie hits the paradigm shift. Bulldog choke gets the win. And then uh, Moxley also accepts Blood and Guts, and they announce Jericho Ortiz for Road Rager, which is in two weeks. And, uh, yeah, that's it for the show. So there you go. A lot of people say this is like the best Dynamite ever. I would not say it was the best Dynamite ever, but it was a hell of a show. It was a great show with a great crowd. Is Miro going to fight God? I don't know. Man. He really is. Uh, the Redeemer is back. And I like that role for, I know some people were probably, who are big Johnny Elite fans, John Morrison fans, were probably pretty salty about him uh, you know, losing like that. But hey, look, Miro coming back, I don't want to see Miro, unless he's killing two people at a time, you know, Miro should be in a mix, always facing, you know, good people and maybe losing some, but... You know, defeating those people. I think with Miro coming back, he is a threat. He's somebody that the fans respond to. His promos have been fantastic, and we haven't seen him to the best of his abilities so far in AEW. Not quite yet. I mean, we did for a little bit with the AEW TV or the uh, the TNT title. <clears throat> Pardon me, but I think there's still a long way you can go with him, and I I hope this is going to be the start of that, and I hope he's going to be here on the regular, and now that he's all healed up and his TV stuff is done, let's go. I love when you can actually see me and I'm doing something and you wrap it up right then. (laughs) I wasn't even paying attention to Hey, you guys want to hear from Nick Aldis tomorrow? (laughs) Well, you're gonna. I got him on the show. Nick Aldis of the NWA. Former... Actually, I shouldn't even say that. But anyway, he's going to be on the uh, show tomorrow. Former, awesome. former NWA champion? Oh, you not want to say righty. That? Were we not supposed to say that? No, we can say that. Uh, we got a lot of, uh, got a lot <laughs> of messages. Me on Twitter. I don't know if I want to talk to him. He blocked you on Twitter? You know, and the amazing part was is... What'd I, you do, was, you idiot? It was during the Impact days where I had always... I was a big fan of Nick Aldis. I'm still a big fan of Nick Aldis. I don't care if they blocked me on Twitter. Uh, but, you know, when he was becoming the Impact champion and they were looking to do... You know, they had good ratings in the UK and you see his whole delivery. You see him in the suit. I thought he was always fantastic. And the only thing I could think of is... Dave, I, I, there was something about Impact that Dave said that he responded to, and then all of a sudden, a couple of days later, I realized I was blocked. So I don't know <laughs> if it was just taking out revenge against anybody that happened to be associated with the site, but I never said one cross word about him. And I think, I really do think he's great. And he's one of those guys that, thank God there is an NWA and other promotions around where you could see Nick Aldis. I know we saw him against Cody Rhodes and Ring of Honor, but he is a... Again, there's a lot of great wrestling out there that is not in WWE or in AEW, and he has been fantastic in the ring. He fits the role. He's always he always sounds great in his interviews. Always looks great. You know, his wife is fantastic. You know, Mickey James is you know one of the best women of all time. I think so. A great package. But come on, block me, Nick. What's that about? Ask him tomorrow. That's how I'm actually going to start off the interview. Yeah, actually, I want to see what you did. I want to see why you got. Uh blocked nick with your punk i'll get ass. blocked by block nobody me? except mm. corbin corbin yeah baron corbin <laughs> which is funny because I, I i bet you anything if corbin lived next door we'd be best friends oh grilling steaks and whatnot oh, i man. can see that man yeah 
we're cut from the same cloth. But uh, but his character, same hairline. His too. character was very boring for a while. Thus, I guess I paid for that. <laughs> No, oh, we right. all paid for it, and they even admitted that. Yeah, yeah. I said the whole thing was boring. <laughs> I get blocked, but they turn into a storyline about how it's boring, and oh, stand up for WWE, brother. Come on, you dork. Unblock me. <laughs> Let's talk watches or something. All right. <laughs> Look at you now that you're Mr. I got a brick on my wrist, oh, you know? Here. All right. Uh, let's talk about some of this. MGF's promo is excellent, this person says. Sorry, everyone. You can pelt me with eggs all you want, but that MGF promo was bloody brilliant. I don't care if it was too insider or reminded you of TNA or WCW. I was locked and engaged the entire time. Incredibly compelling TV. Just excellent. Also, Why does everyone have to hang themselves on a cross? If you like it, you like it. Oh, don't kill me for my... I'm, I think it's great. I don't care. Okay, good. Just just say that you liked it and, and the reasons why. You don't have to hang yourself. This person... I can't even read the headline. MJF could probably say it on national TV, though. I still think the telling line, the one that shifted the crowd to MJF's side, was when he talked about paying ex-WWE guys way more than him. Absolutely, that's what did it. He says, I think that's a dangerous idea to play that could blow up in their face. There are a lot of ex wwe ers at AEW, and they're not all heels. Well, it is ironic that it was followed immediately by a match with two ex wwe guys. And uh, they didn't get uh, booed out of the building or anything like that. This person here says, Brian, I think the end game is a faction war. AEW Originals versus ex wwe guys. MJF will lead... So he's going to be a babyface. This is what you guys don't get. I don't think that's supposed to be a babyface promo. If you listen, I didn't say I don't think. If you listen to that promo, in no universe was he trying to turn babyface. But that's what happened. Because you run that risk doing promos like this. When you have a really talented guy who's really great at what he does, and he goes and does something like that, what do you expect to happen? Like, that's been the other thing. It's like, what did you expect to happen? That people were going to, like, start chanting for Tony Khan and beg him to come out? They were going to storm the ring? Like, what did you think the result of that is going to be besides people going, yeah, we are idiots. MJF, you are the man. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also WrestlingObserver.com. Want to uh, if you get to my Twitter at Brian Alvarez, I've linked up the tweet by Brian Pillman Jr. Want to send condolences to him on the death of his mother, Melanie Pillman, passed away. So uh, he's got some stuff up there, and uh, Facebook he's written a lot more as well. And I'm sure there's going to be something up on the front page with some quotes as well. But uh, all the best to uh, Brian Pillman Jr. on the passing of his mother. I think we just saw a little while ago on that, uh, was it Dark Side of the Ring? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously the story was told on the Dark Side of the Ring and everything, and then, you know, we got everything that came with it with MJF and (laughs) afterwards, which was a little shaky there. But yeah, I mean, you know, also went out with the Ultimate Warrior, as everybody remembers as well, too, and had a... A very troubled life, obviously, just like Brian Pillman had a very troubled life. And the bottom line is there are kids that lost their mother, you know, yesterday. And that's really the only thing that matters at the end of the day. So the best to the entire Pillman family and everybody affected by that. Yes, it was Dark Side of the Ring. So uh, if you haven't seen that one, it's uh, it's quite the episode, if I recall. So uh, all the best to uh, Brian Pillman Jr. and his family. We're going to uh, wrap it up for today. But if you're a subscriber to WrestlingObserver.com... Uh, myself and Vinny, both racked with COVID. We'll be back later on tonight. The uh, Brian and Vinny Show talking AEW and NXT. Vinny's thoughts on whatever's going on with MJF. We're going to talk about that. And uh, I'll be back uh, tomorrow on this show. Wrestling Observer Live. I want to thank you all for listening today. Top tier uh, YouTube subscribers, Twitch homies. We'll talk to you next time. Wrestling Observer Live. <laughs>